first of all, from all of our distinguished guests. If anyone knows what the HTTP code of 410 means, anyone? Chris, would you know? Not uh, offhand, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to put you out of your misery. It's gone, G-O-N-E. And uh, let me find, I've got that somewhere. Where's my It's drone? gone. It's Randy, gone. I just thought, just thought that. It's it gone. is gone. I just looked and, it up. Uh, here it is. Okay, gone. A 410 status code is returned if the new address is altogether unavailable or the server admin does not want to reveal it. Upon receiving a 410 status code, please everybody make a note of this if you're running servers, the client should not request, oh, clients, the client should not request the resource again in the future. Clients, such as search engines, should remove the resource from their indexes. So I guess that means that if you're sending out a 410, uh, 410 uh, Google should dereference you or whatever, de-index you. Our distinguished guest today, I don't want to embarrass him, but we really, everybody's very excited to have Chris Beekler with us. Chris, welcome for your first time uh, on the VUC. Thanks. Glad to be here. This is, this is excellent, and uh, we encourage you to go take a look at pfsense.org, pfsense.org, to find out what we're talking about. Uh, Chris is a co-founder, right, of PFSense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And PFSense, uh, if I say the word firewall, I don't think that really does it justice. But before we get into PFSense, Chris, what is your background? Where did you come from, and where are you going? Um, I've got mostly a IT security networking background uh, up until uh, starting this project. Uh, originally got involved with uh, Monowall before PFSense existed and uh, saw the need for, for something that's, uh, you know, Monowall is a great system, but it's targeted towards very small uh, hardware platforms. And by the nature of its design, there's not a whole lot of uh, expandability or any of the more um, advanced functionality that you need in a uh, more enterprise class firewall. And uh, so that's where that's where it started, uh, with the ability to take advantage of the things that, that bigger hardware uh, has to offer. And we still support the smaller hardware uh, as well. This, this might be a dumb question, and forgive me if it is, uh, but you, we see the reference to Monowall. Is, is PFSense a fork of Monowall, or what is the exact relationship? Yeah, it was, it was originally. Um, the two have diverged very significantly sure. since then. Uh, but yeah, originally that's where we, where we started. Okay. Um, besides being a firewall, let's get into some of the things that PFSense actually is. Yeah, we've got a, a wide range of, of other features uh, yeah, along the lines of what you'd find in any uh, commercial firewall device, um, like a Cisco ASA or a SonicWall or, or similar. Uh, and there's also a number of add-on packages that you can uh, run, depending on what exactly you want to put uh, on your firewall. Uh, Things like Snort, Squid for proxy server. Um, there's an asterisk package. Uh, a whole range of things. There's you know, 50 some odd packages or so. So there's a lot of uh, capability to, to expand uh, what you what you want to do. Whether or not it's sensible sometimes to, to do some of those things uh, on your actual firewall it is questionable and depends on who you ask and and your specific circumstances. But uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in my. Uh, slides that I got. Okay. I remember that uh, a, a friend, Coleman um, Carpenter, asked me, I don't think he could make it for this session, was asking about uh, the need to control the internet access uh, for his teenage daughter who is now, you know, doing uh, Facebook and so on rather than homework. Uh, he mentioned Squid. I'm not that familiar with these things, but is PFSense any kind of a match for this kind of a job where you're restricting in-house Internet access? Yeah, and you can, uh, there's a range of things that you can do for that. Um, there's time-based uh, firewall rules, so you can put them on a schedule. So if you only want to allow uh, Internet access for certain times of the day, you can do that. Some people actually enable a captive portal and generate vouchers, which is generally what you, you know, what, like coffee shops and hotels and whatnot will you know hand out vouchers for a certain period of internet access, but some people actually 
we'll generate those for their kids and give them a couple hours of internet uh, if they do what they're supposed to do, and uh, they don't get a, another code if they uh, if they don't you know do their chores or what have you. There's a uh, I mean, Squid and Squid Guard can can do things like restrict what uh, URLs people can get to, and they have time-based restrictions and other uh, various things as well. Yeah, we've lost Randy on the Hangout. We've lost your audio. Sorry about that. Somebody was complaining that you were hearing me twice, so I, I cut one of the pots. Uh, I think we're okay now, everybody? Yes, you you're fine. Me? Yes. Um, the other question James had... Well, go ahead, James. Ask the question. It was a good one. Um, yeah, I'm just curious to, f to uh, understand where the name PF Sense came from, because it's, a, it's an interesting name and not obvious. Yeah, well, and... Uh, the underlying packet filter that we use is PF, and the name came uh, after much searching, trying to come up with something and find something uh, that, one, wasn't already filled in Google results, and two, had domains available, uh, proved difficult. So uh, making sense of PF is where the uh, the name uh, originated from. And I've Okay, so it's packet filter, not yep. as <laughs> in the French. <laughs> poof, poof. Which, so now we know. Packet yeah. filter does make sense now that you mention it. Of course, we all we're all pretty familiar with PF. Okay, we can probably launch into the the presentation. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty afterwards, but we'll get into detail. But uh, Chris, if you want to just go ahead and uh, put up whatever you've got, and let's hear yeah. about it. Okay. Okay, and I have to say how wonderful it is to have a presenter that presents wonderfully clear slides. <laughs> All right. Uh, True. This thing wants to be a slideshow. Let me go back. Just put it in full screen. Okay. Uh, you guys can... That's coming through correctly? Yes, great. Okay. Good deal. Uh, so, yeah, PFSense is a FreeBSD-based firewall distribution. It's uh, specifically tailored to be a, a firewall uh, and, or, and or router. Um, everything is done, managed via the web interface. Uh, the command line is still there for uh, anyone who wants to get in and, and hack, There's uh, but there's no, no need to do so. Hold the masochist. Yes. <laughs> The uh, the config configuration is a single XML file. Everything in the system is uh, just in that one file, so it's uh, easy to back up and restore. Uh, it's easy to create a template config of sorts and then uh, just make minor modifications and uh, restore it for your new uh, deployments and things like that. Um, talked a bit about how we originally started with Monowall uh, and the, the uh, origin of the, the name. And we got a, a lot of base features, uh, everything that you find in any uh, typical firewall, and uh, a lot of packages that extend that functionality depending on uh, what exactly you're you're looking to add. And it's pretty comparable to any commercial firewall you you find out there. Uh, we have a number of means of getting support: mailing lists, forum, uh, IRC channel on on Freenode, uh, pound pf sense, and uh, we also have commercial support. And it's a uh, Free in every sense. Code base is uh, BSD licensed. Most of the underlying services are BSD licensed. Uh, just some stats on the the project. Uh, we have had millions of downloads since the the project's inception. Um, the one way we have of actually having some kind of count of how many installs are out there uh, every month each system updates its IPv4 BOGON list uh, once a month, and then we can take that count and uh, just count the number of unique public IPs that are there. Well, and, uh, what list are you talking about now, Chris? Uh, on the, the, IPv4, the IPv4 BOGON list, so the list of unassigned uh, ah, okay. networks, networks that should not be seen on the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's actually a static list at this point because uh, basically all the with the exception of reserve space, uh, IPv4 space is assigned, but it, mm -hmm. it, you know, years ago it actually changed as uh, IP space was uh, distributed. But, uh, the, so the system still updates that uh, once a month just in case it, it ever 
changes and then we can count the number of unique public IPs from that and then at least have a minimum count of how many systems are live and under counts it since a, uh, at times a number of systems will come out from the same public IP and uh, some systems don't have DNS configured so they can't fetch the update and some are on private networks so they can't get out to the internet but uh, of the ones we can count there are over 147,000 uh, live mm -hmm. installs and this year we've added about 4,000 installs a month on average uh, more than 36,000 foreign members, 1,200 people on the mailing list. Uh, we've had over 150 people contribute to code uh, over the last eight years, uh, 79 in the last year, which has gone up quite a bit since we moved our source over to GitHub. It makes it real easy for people to just make a one-off uh, contribution request to merge, and that includes people who may just submit a merge request for you know a handful of line changes that they just something they they found that they fixed. Um, is one of the largest open source teams in the world. If you look at the, the stats on uh, Olo, they generate stats on a huge number of open source projects. Um, we have about 10 active uh, committers, people who can actually merge the source in. Um, most of the contributors uh, don't actually have the ability to merge source back in. Uh, they can just make a merge requests on GitHub. And uh, millions of page views across uh, all of our sites every month in over 200 different countries. It's very impressive. The uh, wide range of usage, the, some of the bigger ones that uh, we see are the more common ones. Um, hosting and co-location uh, facilities, it's a good alternative, especially since we have high availability capabilities, so you have full uh, stateful failover. Um, if you look at the commercial alternatives for that, especially at the kind of performance levels that you want in a co-location facility, it's big, big money, and we can do it for a whole heck of a lot less and provide the, the same kind of functionality. Um, VoIP providers is a, another big one, uh, both at their colo facilities and a lot of times they'll deploy to customers. They'll uh, get tired of having to deal with the whatever the customer's network is, is doing or whatever their firewall is doing to, to break or mess with or otherwise disturb their uh, VoIP traffic and just go put in their own firewall and leave the VoIP network separate from the uh, the customer's uh, regular internal network. So there's a, a number of VoIP providers who, who do that. Um, ISPs and wireless ISPs, uh, quite a few of those who deploy to customers in various parts of their uh, their infrastructure. Um, hotspot internet providers like hotels, airports, coffee shops, uh, got a significant presence there. Uh, a lot of people use virtual firewalls. Uh, actually, most of our infrastructure runs in uh, virtual firewalls. Even our uh, uh, co-location facilities all pretty much run uh, virtual. Um, and pretty much every kind of government and private company and nonprofits and all kinds of uh, businesses and, and home users. So okay. why use VFSense? Uh, it, it hides the, the complexity of, of what is underneath. Um, it's a lot more than just writing out a config file with a few options and, and off you go. Uh, there's a lot of other bits and pieces um, to how all these things need to tie together. And uh, until you really start digging into some of this stuff, you don't necessarily realize how uh, complex some of this is. Uh, it's, it's really not quick or simple to manually configure these things. Um, even being an expert at it, it would take me, uh, for some certain types of configurations, it might take me a couple of days to do something I could knock out an hour or two uh, using PFSense if I had to manually configure it. Uh, it eases management as well, generally have you know, things like input validation that keeps you from shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, and the ease of training people who aren't necessarily familiar with the system. You know, a lot of uh, hardcore BSD firewall guys kind of eh, shrugged at what we were doing at first, and then uh, yeah, after a while, they they tried it out and uh, and they realized, wow, this is you know pretty nice. And they got really really tired of being the only person who understood their firewall. So they but they had other people who would you know could could operate uh, you know any typical commercial firewall, and they were tired of getting 3 a.m. phone calls because nobody else knew how to work the firewall. So uh, we've converted a lot of really hardcore uh, BSD guys from that. And we got a uh, proven customized OS that's uh, specifically tailored. It's a, 
a firewall and router. It's not quite stock FreeBSD. It's um, close to it, and, but we have a, a number of kernel patches and different configuration options and things where it's uh, specifically tailored for this, this purpose. We have five different platforms. Uh, the live CD, uh, the, just the ISO that you can boot from and you actually run from that. Um, you can save the config to a, a floppy disk or a USB flash drive. Um, the full install, you can uh, run the installer from the live CD and actually install it to your uh, hard drive or RAID array or, or what have you. Uh, embedded is for any kind of media that should run uh, read only most of the time, like compact flash or USB flash drives. If you're running from them, um, if you leave them read write mounted, you'll uh, kill the, the flash pretty quickly. They have limited uh, write lifetime. So the embedded version is uh, generally for hardware that runs on compact flash. And the OVA is an open virtual appliance. Uh, that's something you can import into VirtualBox, VMware, uh, etc. And the memstick is it's it's the equivalent of the live CD, except it's um, for USB flash. So if you don't have a, a CD-ROM, you can write the uh, memstick version out to a USB flash drive and it boot off the USB, and it functions the same as the the live CD does. Uh, the 2.0.2 stable release is coming out um, any day now. Uh, 201 is currently the the most recent uh, stable release. 2.1 is in beta, and that's what we're currently working on. Uh, we'll have a at least a release candidate out before the end of the year. Uh, the biggest change there is uh, full IPv6 support, uh, which is taking a heck of a lot more work than uh, what any of us had anticipated. You know, if it was as simple as just putting a front end on this stuff, we would have been done months ago. Uh, but it turns out a lot of the underlying pieces um, not even necessarily the OS, but a lot of the services and other things. Um, we had to fix a number of things in the underlying uh, software that we use. So it was a whole lot more work than uh, than what we anticipated. IPv6 is still it, it's got to be the most immature 15 plus year old technology that I've uh, ever uh, experienced. But it's it's finally coming along as uh, it's getting more attention and, and getting more widely deployed. And we were going to get a little bit into the IPv6 thing, but first, um, and welcome Keith, I'm, I'm sorry I forgot to invite you, and I wanted to very early on. Um, no problem. Hi. Lots of lots of questions and comments, I'm sure, but James had one early on, and it scrolled off my screen, so James, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, uh, I've been meaning to, to, to build a PFSense platform. Uh, for some time, um, and I just haven't got around to it. What would be really useful would be to have you just run through um, what needs to be done in rough sort of order in order to build a platform which we can then um, put a whole load of stuff and, on and, and play with. So over to you, Chris, and, and can we have your video back again? Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. It's slides. Yeah, so uh, I mean, yeah, we could walk through a what a, just a initial setup. Is that uh, you know, what you're interested in, or? Yeah. So uh, my scenario is I have a reasonably uh, interesting domestic setup with multiple broadbands. Uh, I have teenage children. Uh, I have lots of devices around the place. I have over a quarter of mile of structured cabling in my kitchen alone. <laughs> Uh, and I currently have a, an antiquated and rather nasty Cisco ASA uh, firewalling me with the outside world on just one of my, uh, my on my main broadband. I need to do something better. Uh, I believe PFSense is the answer, and I just want somebody to tell me what to do because the one thing I don't have is a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, we have multi WAN support, and uh, that's uh, all very commonly done stuff. Uh, and you, you kind of start just by pick, picking out what kind of hardware you want to run. You know, if you got something, an old PC or something laying around or some kind of old Im embedded hardware, or w just some spare device uh, somewhere that you want to okay. use, it'll, it'll probably work. Well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty keen to, because I'm a pretty eco-friendly green sort of person, even though I'm yellow today on the video, um, I'd like to um, try and keep the, the power consumption down if I can. So something reasonably modern and reasonably 
power efficient would be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. For a, a lot of people, it's better to just toss your old PCs and get something new that's uh, lower power consumption and just as powerful or as powerful as you need. Uh, the the lowest power uh, new hardware that I'm aware of is the the Alex from uh, PC Engines. Runs at about three watts. Um, and it's a 500 megahertz geode, 256 megs of RAM. You can do about 85 megabits or so through it. Uh, it had two or three hundred meg NICs on it. Uh, good platform. It's uh, the lowest end new hardware I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, if you need to push significantly more bandwidth than that, then the an Intel Atom would be the kind of the next step up uh, that's still low power consumption. Uh, exactly how much depends on which CPU it is, but generally somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 watts or so, which is significantly less than your average you know, old PC. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I, I'd be keen to implement something that would uh, give me a little bit of headroom so I can uh, add extra functionality to it. So, for example, <coughs> running um, an asterisk or even a free switch combo in with PF Sense. Yeah. Yeah, in that case, you probably want to go with an Atom because, uh, like, the Alex has a fixed amount of RAM. You can't put any more than 256 megs in it. And you, once you start adding stuff uh, beyond the, the base system, then you, you can't get a whole heck of a lot in 256 megs of RAM. Um, anymore. Yeah, so what sort of specification, if I was going to go out and buy one tomorrow, what, what would you say, bearing in mind that I'm likely to want to put something like FreeSwitch on there with PFSense, and probably some of your super duper sort of add-on mo modules which you seem to be bringing out with uh, on a daily basis? <laughs> uh, it depends on which ones you want to use. Uh, you know, I'm, and I guess with FreeSwitch it kind of depends on what kind of config you have in place and what usage of it. I'm not sure what its general hardware sizing guidelines are. Um, I would probably do at least a, a gig of RAM. Um, if you want to do Snort, I would probably go two or four gigs of RAM because it's uh, by far the most memory and CPU intensive thing that we've got, um, depending on what kind of config that you have on it. If you get most of the preprocessors -pro enabled, it uh, chews up a good deal of RAM and processor. Um, but aside from that, I mean, anything, probably anything else that you would do in a network like that, you'd be in pretty good shape with a gig of RAM, and I would say you're definitely in good shape with with two. I think you'd have you'd be hard pressed to, to run out of two gigs of RAM. I think okay. unless you're trying. Well, that sounds pretty good. So uh, a gig of RAM with an Atom processor, a minimum of two uh, 100 meg uh, network interface cards or ports on there, um, and I think. Uh, I can probably get something like that for around uh, 100, 120 pounds here in UK, the little case, perhaps. Yeah, that, that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's within my budget. I'm going to go rush out and do it. <laughs> okay, uh, John uh, Bela, I'm going to unmute him if I can find he, He's looking for the uh, unmute key. I'm trying to find him on. Uh, here he is. I'm going to unmute him and he'll ask his question. You are now unmuted. I'll pretend I'm Allison. John, are you with us? Great, great. Um, thanks for being on the show. We've we've been running PFSense at my house for years. Even my wife likes it for using her Nexus 7 to get back in from somewhere out where she's shopping. She wants to set up the Myth TV box to record something. Um, so in the past, there had been uh, questions about running something like the uh, Nortel video phone where you had two different SIP streams uh, and uh, and using the NAT that came with PFSense versus using a different style of NAT. Can you address that or is that taken care of in version 2? I just recently went to 2.1 so I haven't actually had a chance to try it. Uh, that was probably because at one point we did not rewrite the source port on 5060 by default several years uh, back because uh, at the time that would that seemed to break uh, more VoIP than it uh, than it fixed, so we changed that to rewrite the source port. So the uh, the way the PFSNAT works, if you don't rewrite the source port, you can only register one device at the same time. Um, and SIP phones generally have 5060 both as a source and destination port, which is uh, unusual. The source port is usually, but it's almost never the same as the destination port, but that's um, relatively right. common yeah. in SIP devices. So the, in, in that case, you can only NAT uh, one device out uh, per public IP. 
because it uses the okay. uh, destination IP, the source IP, the source public IP, and the source and destination port. So if you don't randomize the source port and your uh, devices internally are using the uh, 5060 as the source and destination, then uh, then you can only register one device at a time. Okay, so, so aside from broken devices, you should be able to do it now and have multiple devices work out through the NAT without installing something like FreeSwitch or Asterisk as a module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you could before too. You just had to use manual app on that to uh, to rewrite the source port on fifty sixty. Okay, so so what I want to try then at home is I uh, want to put the PS Sense module in for free switch, just to use that for inbound SIP because I want to have something there at the proxy level that protects my in, inside asterisk that's a little more delicate, let's say. I, I, I want mm -hmm. the function of your box to protect my inside stuff so I don't have to be so careful on the inside. And then um, for the, the time when I want to use a video phone, then I just skip that entirely and go straight out through the NAT. Mm. It should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I, I will try that and uh, do a little write-up on my blog, so thanks. I was coming from uh, ZipDX, and I, that's why I turned my photo off, because you don't want to look at me while that's going on. Let me remove this now. Uh, what, a, <laughs> what other, who, who else is ready? Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get Keith in here, because uh, Keith is somebody that I've known for quite a while. I have a lot of respect for him. Keith, welcome to the call. Hi. Hi, Dave. often have you with us, but uh, here's a chance to chat with Chris, so I'm sure you have a question or comment. Yeah, I'm just kind of interested. I'm on the 2.1 um, at the moment, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that sort of turning into a um, into a release candidate and so on. Uh, I'm very, very pleased with the IPv6 capability on it. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been playing around with that, and it's been very good. Where do you see the next big IPv6 was was kind of the big thing for 2.1. Where do you see the next um, big development going to be for 2.2 and onwards? Yeah, there, there's nothing really huge that's, uh, you know, 2.0 kind of changed everything. I mean, every single portion of the system got a uh, major upgrade and, and reworking to, as it, is the, the project really gained uh, mass acceptance between the, like, 1.2 release and uh, 2.0, and then everybody wanted to add all kinds of functionality to every part of the system, and that's why it took ages to uh, get that release out. It was about three years or so. Uh, from here, we're doing uh, less revolutionary and more evolutionary. So we have a smaller subset of changes. Um, IPv6 ended up being much, more, much larger than what we expected it would be. But uh, going forward, we're not going to have you know massive, massive changes in every uh, every release. It'll be more you know, in incremental improvements yeah, here and there. Um, exactly what they'll be. Generally, we do what people are willing to pay for because the bulk of the work on the project is done by people on our payroll, and uh, so that's just the financial necessity of it, and I don't necessarily know what uh, you know who's going to show up uh, tomorrow and want to pay for X feature kind of kind of thing. So, um, so we don't have exactly uh, anything in mind uh, specifically yet for for two dot two. Uh, we'll just kind of see what uh, see what comes along, and there will be some IPv6 things that we're not. Um, probably going to have to the the point where we'd ideally like to see them, maybe. Um, some of the which because. Sure. The things just aren't don't exist yet. Like the dynamic uh, our dynamic dynamic DNS client does not support v6 yet, but that's just because none of the providers support it. Yeah. So I mean, we can't support anything that they don't support. Um, and then Captive Portal doesn't support it because there's a whole lot of complexities in the uh, back end there. You really want to authenticate v4 and v6 at the same time, and then you have to figure out what their IPs are on both. And uh, doable, but uh, a good chunk of work and the. The major customers that we have that do uh, Captive Portal stuff, they don't really care about V6. I initiated some discussions with them about it, and they're like, yeah, we don't care. I'm like, okay. So, that's one that got kind of pushed off. So there's going to be some some minor stuff like that with, with V6 that'll uh, be a 2.2 thing. But, uh, I okay. don't really have any major things in mind at the moment. Okay. That's cool. Let's see if we... See if we can bring Jamie back in uh, now that I muted him. I'm not sure I can unmute him. Let's see. Now I muted him, and I unmuted him. Jamie, you there? Yeah, I unmuted myself. 
Okay, perfect. You're, there you are. <laughs> Questions? So, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of them today. Let's see. Uh, SIP application layer gateways. That uh, is something that's always problematic in firewalls. Do you guys attempt to have a working SIP application layer gateway, or do you leave that up nope. to... <laughs> nope. That's... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I've never heard of anyone who's had any good luck with uh, those things. Uh, every, the only thing I ever hear about those is turn it off, turn it off. It just breaks everything. So yeah, we don't uh, we don't attempt to do that. You know, we you got to set your extern IP and your NAT uh, in asterisk or you know, similar in in other solutions. You know, let the let the PBX take care of that. It's in a much better position to do so, and there's no reason for the firewall to destroy your SIP traffic because that's all that those things ever seem to actually do. So yeah, so we do. We don't touch anything within the body of SIP. Nice. More things that uh, destroy SIP traffic. We've noticed lately that a number of IP PBX manufacturers are um, not liking symmetric NAT, that they tend to prefer full cone NAT, and they feel free to write articles about that. Um, what method of port translation do you use? Uh, by default, we will rewrite the source port on everything. Uh, you can disable that if necessary. Uh, some providers will flip if you do that. Um, sometimes you'll end up with one-way audio um, if you do that. So, yeah, that's... Then there are some other, you know, considerations there. I mean, it depends on what your uh, provider expects. And we, we try to have a sane set of defaults that will work for everyone, but that's just proven to be impossible. Right, so, we, so, so you're using symmetric NAT? Most, most people, yeah. Yeah, we just try to do what works for... Uh, the majority, and unfortunately, the you know, that's not nearly everyone, but such is life with VoIP and in, uh, in firewalls and that. Right. So specifically, uh, one of the problems we've seen with um, symmetric NAT is that UDP connection timeouts need to be adjusted. I assume that can be done in PFSense. Yeah. Uh, the yeah the default UDP timeout is uh, one minute, and if you have a, a SIP keep alive that's less or that's greater than that, then yeah, you you may lose your SIP states and your phones will uh, drop off their registrations. Um, at least if they're registering to an outside PBX or your SIP trunks if your PBX is inside the firewall. So yeah, uh, under the system advanced uh, firewall and that, there's uh, options for uh, state timeouts, and if you set that to conservative mode, that's uh, how you can bump that uh, timeout there so it doesn't drop your EDP sessions that raises it to five minutes. Yeah, we actually noticed um, some providers are now sending reinvites at 15 minutes, and wow. you know because those are coming back in, you know we wouldn't have a way to deal with that if we could only set it to five minutes. So we've been setting it to like 16 and a half, which randomly happens to be nine 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 seconds. That just worked well for us. But uh, there, there's no there's no way to uh, deal with a 15 minute reinvite for providers that are trying to detect dropped calls. Uh, you can go even higher than that. There's a, what is it called? High latency, I believe, is the uh, the higher option. I have yet to see any of them that actually needed that. Generally, the uh, the phones will do a SIP keep alive, uh, so they don't have to. So they at least are sending something uh, less than every five minutes. Yeah. No, the interesting part here being if it's an internal IP PBX, I guess we could bump up the uh, keep alives from asterisk. Um, out, out to the provider, that'd probably be the way to go. And that'll, yeah, that'll take care of it, yeah. And as far as I know, the defaults, and, and when it gets to specifics of configuring the PBX side, that's getting outside of my area of expertise, but it, as far as from what I've seen, the, the defaults on every PBX are, are sane in that regard. Uh, they should be, should be fine. All right, three more quick questions for you. Do you have root access to the box? Because we tend to like to install some of the things Randy's talked about on uh, the VUC, like threat stop on our boxes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you so, can. Yep, you uh, get uh, root access to the shell, yeah. Um, your snort, is that IDS or IPS? So can we use it to drop things or just to detect them? Uh, IDS with blocking. So if uh, some an IP trips a uh, rule, you can kill the states from that IP and uh, block everything from that IP. Uh, wow, but you're not actually um, using Snort's IPS capability to stop that. No, it's, it's not in line, no. Okay. Wow. Um, it made me sad when another person took out their inline implementation. And, and my final question, which um, I just find is interesting, is have you seen Ubiquity's Edge Max yet? Randy and I had traded a couple of emails on that, and I was just curious to know if you've seen that um, product <laughs> announcement. I've glanced at it, uh, looked at it in any kind of depth, not really, no. 
Okay. But I haven't looked yeah. at it yet. Kind of interesting. They got the Tali report to, uh, or they got Tali Group to write them a report that says mm. that they are uh, performing much better than some of the major vendors at a significantly less price point. Yeah, there's some caveats to that. They're they're running uh, through an ASIC and uh, not exactly doing the kind of filtering that you might find in a normal, maybe real world kind of deal. I mean, that's kind of a yes, it can filter that fast if you can run the filtering on the on the ASIC. Uh, I did look at the, that report and what the results of it are. Yeah, and it's impressive performance with some caveats. Yeah, I, I look at it more as a router than a firewall anyways. But. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really what it is, yeah. All right, well, thanks a bunch. Sure. While um, we're waiting for more questions in IRC or whatever, uh, and please don't hesitate. This is a great opportunity. Uh, my question to you, Chris, would be, um, with all the news, all the security news, I'm sure everyone here follows it. There's an incredible amount of, you know, people are, pe not people, but bots are looking at every port and trying to break into every possible system, including power grids, but of course, you know, VoIP systems, all of the, anything that's on an IP, whether IPv4 or 6, um, where do you see the future of PVS, uh, PFSense in all this? I mean, are you thinking of anything to do with all of the random attacks that are going on? Is there any specific work going on to that or anything you want to comment on that? Because we're living in a horribly insecure world now yeah, only because yeah. people are just discovering, oh, my God, I'm connected to the Internet, basically. And, you know, there it is, which was, you know, the Internet was made to connect everything to everything, and now we're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we... Continue to develop the product to you know address things as as things change. You know, firewall is only a, a small part of uh, the total overall uh, security. So you know, we don't necessarily do everything, but you know we can't at the network level. Uh, so yeah, I mean we we continue to to develop things, but uh, you know it, it it'll never be a silver bullet because no such thing can exist uh, or ever will exist. We'll be able to develop. Better capabilities with time, but uh, yeah, it will never be perfect. I mean, I, I think about the simplest things of a spam block list and so on, and 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 uh, proc mail recipes. I realize it's not the same, but what I'm saying is that we're, you're always playing whack a mole with these things and always chasing stuff. So it's yeah. it's really hard to keep on ahead of it, or you can maybe keep ahead of it by like 20 seconds or something. Great question, Chris, from, uh, from PhoneBuff, who asks you to mention commercial support option and project funding, because obviously <laughs> people are working hard, and maybe there's a way to help you. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, yeah that was my next slide, and I'll go back to that briefly. Uh... Perfect. So the early days of the project... Um, Scott Ulrich and I founded it. Uh, others came along, volunteers. Uh, gather a lot of interest initially, as a lot of open source projects do, but they also tend to, to die off pretty quickly. Uh, and people come and go, and the, the project has uh, grown considerably. And so it was a typical open source operation, you know, filling your own needs. People come along and you know, contribute something that they wanted to see, and there's, there's always excitement surrounding a, a new project. And, so that kept things going initially. Uh, and then as the project grew, the demand for related services for it grew, uh, support, paid development, uh, and related things. So we uh, started the company behind it, uh, BSD Perimeter, in 2006. So that's uh, it, it's the holder of the, the copyright and the trademark. Uh, we started off from commercial support in 2007. Initially, uh, just copied the commercial vendor's model of doing a per install support. Um, problem with that is it's not really suitable for open source. You have no idea what people have out there. You know, people buy support on one install and, and get it on 10 installs, and we would have a difficult time uh, having any kind of control over that. Um, and it's problematic for firewalls in general because every problem has to be the firewall. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's got to be the firewall to blame if you have any kind of problem you know, whatsoever. So the kind of people that uh, we were in initially uh, getting to purchase were the ones who wanted tons and tons of help and you know, thought if they typoed an email address and then the email bounced back that the firewall blocked it. Like, no, 
no. We really did get inquiries like that at the time. So you, you have to live in scope if you do uh, you know, per install support. That's what commercial vendors do. They will get to the point where they can eliminate the firewalls that cause the issue until you have a nice day and have fun figuring out your problem. So that's uh, not really what we want to do. I mean, we want to help people solve the, their problems, and that's we have the capability of doing so. Everybody we have on staff has a wide range of experience, and uh, not just firewalls and networking, but switches and servers and Linux and Windows and uh, on and on. So uh, we wanted to help, but that's you just can't do that and find any way to to price things reasonably if you're uh, doing it on a per install basis. So uh, we transitioned to doing hourly support uh, in 2008. Uh, brought up the site portal.pfsense.org, which is uh, where you can get support today. And uh, things really took off from there. Yeah, we, uh, within a few months, I was able to, to start doing this full time. And uh, since then, the, the bulk of the work on the project is, is done by people that we employ. And uh, as I mentioned before, what gets done is what people pay us to do aside from general maintenance, which we uh, have some things left over from other uh, some of the money from the support goes back to to fund the, the general maintenance. And there's still a, a good deal of outside contributors, but with any kind of project that's as, as large and, and complex as, as what we're doing, you just have to have, uh, you got to have people who are making a living full time to keep things moving along. There's just too much work for uh, volunteers to be able to do. And the kind of maintenance day-to-day -day stuff is just, it's not something somebody wants to go home and do in their free time. You know, they may want to do that to, create a new feature or something like that that they find interesting, but you know, the ongoing maintenance is uh, something that you generally don't find uh, too many contributors to, to work on. So the commercial success has been critical. The, the project would be uh, dead by now without it. So yeah, you can find out more about our uh, support at portal.pfsense.org. Okay, and that's worth repeating that obviously everything that you want to know is at pfsense.org. Who else yep. has a question here? A lot of people on the phone, oddly enough. Uh, just, I, I just would like to mention that he's also got a book. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> There's my book, yes. Thank you, Keith. Yeah. Let, let's keep that on for a second. Let me put that, hold that up one more time. Put you on. The Definitive Guide. We'll uh, try to post a link on the some of the sites. Yeah, we're currently working on the next edition of that right now, too, actually. I was about uh, to ask that. Is there, a, is there an update due? Because that was based on uh, the 1.2.3 yeah. stream, yeah. Yep. So we're uh, hoping that we can get a new edition close to the, the same time that 2.1 comes out. We're writing it based on 2.1. Excellent. Well, Bob is Kindle. holding up his copy. Hey, Bob. The Kindle, the Kindle version. Oh, the Kindle version. That's right. He's holding <laughs> up his Kindle or Nexus or whatever. No, the what is that? Is that a Kindle? It's a Kindle Fire original. Ooh. There you go. Well, we've got the audience here. Okay, more questions for Chris. Come on, we have a unique opportunity here. Although he'll be back next week. No, I'm just kidding. I have a... <laughs> uh, go ahead, okay. Bob. I, I have a quick observation when I install PFSense. Um, in fact, um, I, I actually thought it was a great feature that it broke all my SIP registrations until I changed the firewall mode to conservative because I said, wow, that is really paying attention to um, UDP connections and, and doing the right thing. So I considered that a, a good selling point. <laughs> yeah, so uh, most of the time people seem to be seem to get by okay with the, with the defaults, but yeah, if it's uh, more than a minute, you'll you'll have to bump it to conservative. Yeah, it it broke. Um, I mean, it broke like eighty percent of my registrations, and 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 uh, I didn't really spend a lot of time figuring out why some of them worked and some of them failed. But uh, but flipping it to conservative, everything just worked. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bob, specific to VoIP, why would that be? Um, no ideas at all. I, I think, it was, I, as I think, as Chris described, it was the timings of the registrations to the various providers. I have, you know, I have my own Camellio box outside PFSense. I have, you know, get on SIP. I have SIP to SIP dot info. Um, a whole bunch of, you know, twenty or thirty different uh, registrations, and not all of them broke. Do you, um, without mentioning any names, Bob, in your professional capacity, are you guys, meaning wh wherever you're working, uh, using PFSense or not? Yeah, we actually. Um, that's a good question, Randy. So we we are our, our primary firewall is a very expensive ASA fifty five fifty that we went through some pretty painful 
uh, interchanges with Cisco when they started dropping they started dropping packets for not really good reasons, and we were well within the performance guidelines of the ASA. But uh, we actually uh, replaced some of our smaller, you know, office configurations and and smaller point configurations with PFSense in the last two months, and it's been rock solid. Cool. I I have a question. My questions are always really silly, so I have to keep you know putting the disclaimer. If this is a dumb question, I'm sorry. Um, but I am running, uh, Chris. I have an IP. Uh, an ISP who has offered IPv6 for a long, long time, and they give you a set top box because it's a triple play TV, VoIP, uh, internet. It's DSL. Um, years ago, when we had our own router, of course, I would run whatever I wanted on it. Uh, now it's this, you know, black box thing, and I'm wondering what, if any, steps I might want to take, particularly since I'm running IPv6. Now, you mentioned earlier, and I understand it, that IPv6 may or may not be ready for prime time on some levels. Um, is there any argument here, for example, for me to run my local stuff? Um, I'm sitting here with the three computers, four computers in here. Not too worried about phones, but on my computers, obviously, they're presenting unique addresses out there. Is there some argument for putting PFSense on a box and then connecting to that rather than the switch that I'm connecting to? Uh, in that kind of a setup, it kind of depends on how your IPTV and other services work. That can mm -hmm. get to be really problematic, especially depending on what that router that the provider gives you actually does. Because um, sometimes in that black box there's some voodoo magic stuff that makes all of that work. Um, mm -hmm. I've got something kind of similar with the AT&T U-verse where it's uh, the, the TVs and everything are all uh, over IP. Uh, but mm -hmm. you can put in your own router behind that and then so I, I leave the, the TV and other stuff on its own little world there directly connected to the modem but uh, plug in a firewall behind that and uh, and in, in that case I've got a static uh, slash 29 for you can get that for an extra few bucks a month and I mm -hmm. uh, can configure that right on the firewall then so the the public IPs are static and uh, and then everything is, else is behind the, the behind the firewall so kind of depends on what the provider offers generally I probably wouldn't put your TV boxes behind that because there's probably a decent chance that that will break if it's not directly connected to your router, uh, depending on exactly what it does. Well, actually, actually, the, the setup here, I thought this would be typical, but maybe it's not. But the setup here is that there's there are two boxes. One box has, I don't even know which box the disk is in. There's a 250 gig drive. Uh, by the way, this funny thing is there's a BitTorrent client that you can program to download a whole bunch of stuff right in this box. But anyway... No, the, the TV and the VoIP, as far as I can see, are all in the box. Um, of course, yeah, I'm plugging my phone into one of the four. You know, it presents as a typical home router with four uh, Ethernet connectors. Um, I don't care too much about the phones. I'm not that worried about them. Uh, they, them, the provider takes precautions. Uh, you can't come in and sip and make long distance calls or, or call some mobiles here, which are which are uh, expensive in this country. But the rest of it, I mean, is coming into a switch here in in my office, and uh, I'm tempted to put a box in between the switch and my other it, well, to replace the switch, really, um, and maybe that'll be PF sense. I don't know. We'll see. See what happens. Yeah. Uh, Michael White needs to repoint his camera. <laughs> Michael, what is what is he looking at? Who has a, another question for uh, Chris or anything on topic at all? Oh, Michael, Michael, what what is he doing? <laughs> okay, let's pretend we didn't see that. Who else has a question for uh, Chris? Uh, there's a question in the IRC channel. How, yeah. how does the QoS capabilities for PFSense <laughs> stack up with uh, Tomato or DDWRT? Um, Good. I'm trying to remember the last time I've extensively worked with uh, Tomato or DDWRT. I did work with it on a customer project uh, recently, but I don't think I didn't really mess that much with the the QoS. So from what I recall of it and what I've seen of it in the past, it's it, it's pretty basic. It doesn't allow you a whole lot of you know, advanced configurability and uh, and features like that. I mean, if you just have very basic needs, it's probably a wash. They, I'm, I suspect it, that uh, DDWRTs or tomatoes will work 
just fine. Um, if you want to get into some more advanced things, then that's probably where uh, we can do things that you can't do with those. And that's okay. true in general. I mean, that's a you know, tomato and DDWRT are kind of a you know home linksys kind of replacement. And that's not really our our target market. You know, we're we're more in the uh, the Cisco ASA level basically, and more the commercial uh, level. Okay, I'm going to call one more time for questions. Otherwise, we're going to let Chris go because I'm sure he's got plenty of other things to do. I, hey, Randy, I just have another. Go. I just have another observation. Um, I, I converted in my my home configuration. I converted from a manually built IP tables. Um, and one of the things that uh, that 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 um, the excellent GUI on PF Sense did is it is it properly protected my DNS servers, because for about a year and a half in my IP tables configuration, I wasn't properly blocking uh, my DNS until, you know, I saw some DNS amplification attacks. So uh, who knew that IP tables puts the natted uh, uh, packet on the uh, on the forward tree, not the input tree? Um, so uh, one thing, you know, so PFSense just worked out of the box. And in fact, even though I do have the Kindle book, I didn't actually use the book to get PFSense up and running. It just kind of worked. And, and, the, and, the, and the GUI is excellent. Uh, my next project is to set up uh, OpenVPN for home, for home okay. use. Yeah, we've heard that the that the GUI of uh, PV, PFSense is really excellent, by the way, which is great because a product like that you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be because you kind of need to know what you're doing just to understand what it even is. But uh, congrats on that. Let's see who yeah, else we, has got a question. We try to make things as as easy as we can uh, to to some extent, and there's always some. Whenever you allow flexibility, there's always some uh, complexity that's that's inherent in that. So you know. If you're used to a you know, Linksys, then you look at our port forward screen. It's got all these various, you know, <laughs> crazy options where you can do anything you could possibly imagine. And you kind of, some people kind of flip at that point. But the, there's good reason that all that stuff is there. We do well, have a request. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I think hiding it behind the advanced tab was a good thing on that screen. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, but so, sometimes those advanced buttons don't necessarily work. You know? they, people just click them anyway, and they start. And then they don't read the note of why to not do certain things. Yeah, those those advanced buttons are there for a reason, and also pay attention to the notes that are uh, added there, especially when they're bolded and italic. Okay, we do have a couple questions in IRC, but before that, I just want to mention that it, those of us who remember the old routers that you would buy the router and then talk to it via Telnet, uh, you could do some serious damage if you mistype something in those things with the rules and the uh, that whole thing, as James is uh, doing the... Uh, the gestures for that's exactly what I did. You would you you could just lock yourself out of everything. The first question is uh, phone buff. Can Chris mention the NAT with IPsec extension in the 2.1 beta? And might this be ported? Oh, scrolled. Ported to 2.0.2. I hope you know oh, what yeah, I'm talking about. The, yep. Yeah, that's <laughs> the uh, the ability to do NAT and IPsec at the same time. Mm -hmm. This is the way. That that the kernel processing order works. Uh, historically, you haven't been able to NAT and IPsec because the IPsec processing applies and then the NAT applies after it's already encrypted. So there's no ability to uh, to do NAT and IPsec on the same box. So what people would generally do is route the traffic to one box, have it NAT, then send it back to the other one, have it do the IPsec. Kind of ugly, but it works. Uh, but yeah, that has been added to 2.1 recently, and there's a couple people in that production already. Uh, seems to work well, but that's not going to get back part of the 202. 202 is strictly a, a bug fix release, and that's a new feature. So. Okay. Our friend Thomas in Berlin at the moment is asking uh, if there's some kind of rule tester in PFSense. Uh, not exactly. Um, that would be something like if you... Uh, not sure how that would work exactly. I'm not sure if I've seen one of those in a uh, firewall. But basically, if you would uh, maybe tell it the source, this destination, this interface, uh, would it be passed or blocked? Kind of deal. Um, yeah. That would. Yeah, that's kind of what I would uh, imagine from that. Not. There's nothing like that uh, built in or available, as far as I'm. I'm okay. Aware. Let's see if there's. Um... I think there's a discussion going on. Is that a question, Keith? No. You, you just mentioned... Uh... Just an observation, really. I mean, um, yeah. one of the... I had I had some major problems with my old ISP in that they were dropping large UDP packets, um, which was completely messing up some IPsec stuff. And, and they, they didn't even realize it themselves. And 
they, they unfortunately most ISPs are, are not very good at technical support and I yeah. and PSN told me to actually diagnose that by doing a lot of packet dumps from outside the, the router and stuff like that um, mm. eventually I got to the point where I got so frustrated with them that I changed ISP but um, you know it did actually it was fantastic because it meant I could diagnose the problem and drill into it and work out what it was and yeah. um, you know, it's fantastic capability yeah, the built-in pack capture is really handy to uh, be able to easily troubleshoot a, a wide range of issues. John is asking anyone, but I'll uh, I'll voice the question as well for a suggestion for a medium-priced atom box. Uh, how many nicks? How many nicks? Two nicks. What am I, the relay here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say two no, or four. Two or four. Okay, two or four nicks. Uh, for uh, Jetway just put out a new board uh, recently. I've got one sitting behind me here that I have not yet had the chance to play with. But this Here's is one a, I prepared earlier. Is oh. a uh, looks like a nice little board. I uh, haven't had a chance to test it yet, but uh, there's a range of mini ITX stuff that people use. Uh, for uh, six port Adam, there's uh, the 7535 from you can get from NetGate. That's uh, Real good platform. Uh, it's a bit more money because you start adding that many NICs, you start to, or that many gigabit NICs, you start adding up the, the cost a bit. It's about 600 US, I believe, somewhere around there. Um, and I believe Haycom and Appliance Shop also both have a, a couple of uh, options there. Um, if you're looking for hardware and you want to, you know, know what definitely works and what's a what's a good bet, um, if you go to our website and hit the recommended hardware vendors link, there's uh, a few of the vendors that uh, have hardware that that we know works. It's the hardware that we develop and test on. And we got a whole, you know, couple racks of uh, test gear here, uh, and those are also the vendors who help support the project. So, they're uh, you get hardware that you know works and that you know that we're using, and you. Uh, Make sure you're supporting the vendors who who make the project happen. So that's uh, what we would uh, recommend. You know what? Uh, I'm going to conclude with this. Although, what is this? There's a long thing here. It only wishes that better solutions for logging or viewing per IP and per port bandwidth usage. PF flow package seems not to work with multiple it's scrolling, so it's hard to read. But you can read it there, Chris. If you have a comment. Uh, yeah, and the yeah, PF flow D does actually work with. Uh, uh, multiple WANs. It, it logs everything that goes that has a state created, um, but then you need a, a NetFlow collector as well, and that's a good way to, to uh, do your your bandwidth reporting. But you need a separate external system for that. Uh, there's uh, a bunch of other packages you can use for logging and viewing per IP per port usage. Uh, one of the really basic ones that's not super resource intensive is bandwidth D. Um, Intop is another option that. Uh, is a bit heavier as far as much uh, memory and, and CPU it uses. Uh, there's a let me find the link here and I'll paste it in the. Um... Yeah, with Ntop you can actually run that on a separate machine and have the uh, have, have the, the data files piped to it. Yeah, yeah. There's several options there on that page. Um, if you're not in the IRC channel, just Google monitor bandwidth site doc.pfsense.org and you'll uh, you'll find it there. And for VoIP considerations in general, if you uh, if you Google VoIP site doc.pfsense.org, you'll find uh, the our VoIP configuration page, which I update as things change and and we find additional you know considerations or things like that. Then uh, that uh, that page is a, always an up to date good resource. Ah, James has a last question saying that the FW7535 ships with a mini PCI e-slot with SIM carrier. What is that used for? And James from Truphone, so not an unusual question. Yeah, I like SIMs. He, he's got a whole necklace of SIMs. so <laughs> It can be used for uh, 3G, 4G cards. Uh, uh, just working with the customer today, uh, today and yesterday on that, actually, where you can put a... There's a few, it depends on exactly what you're looking for, but Sierra Wireless and other uh, vendors who have 3G and 4G cards and uh, there are many PCIe, and it's uh, and then you put the SIM card in the actual uh, slot on the board. 
Nice. I'll have to rush out and buy one straight away. And you have several sims to put in it. I was just going to conclude with the fact that Maxim had a very good idea as far as the rules test, which is if somebody, you know, you have a rules test section, you can add it to the GUI. And then when somebody types in a rule, especially the longer and more complex it is, the better. And then the answer is simply PFSense rules. <laughs> Pretty clever. Chris, thanks a million for coming and spending a whole hour of your life that you'll never get back. PFSense.org. <laughs> Was thanks great. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Keith, and thanks everybody else who joined. We'll be back in a second with the what we call the mature audiences only VUC. But right now, uh, this is the end of the YouTube presentation. Aren't you glad you stayed to the end? Find more at VUC.me. As usual, thanks so much to Voxdale Labs for their support, Sangoma.com, Onsip.com, E4Strategies.com. The great wideband audio comes from ZipDX.com, a great full-featured conferencing system. Thank you, David Frankel. Thanks to Voxpone for their local rate dial-ins to join the VUC. This really is a great group of people. And we welcome your call. Don't be afraid to talk. Go to VUC.me for further contact info.